I'm Christine Outen, I'm Professor of Management Economics here at SOAS University of London and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Rita McGrath from Columbia Business School who's here to give the 2019 Penrose Lectures. The Penrose Lectures were established in the memory of Edith Penrose who was the first woman Professor of Economics here at SOAS. Rita, let me start by asking you, how has Edith Penrose's work influenced your own thinking and research? Oh, thank you so much for that question, Christine. Um, Penrose looms large over my own work. Um, I came into the field of strategy in the 1990s, and at the time, the newly resurgent uh, resource-based view of the firm was starting to really take the world by storm. And um, that really, I would say, it crystallized in a seminal paper by Thies, Pisano, and Schoen about dynamic capabilities and the structure of the firm. And in contrast to a lot of the dominant ideas in strategy at the time, which took an industry focus and said that profitability and sustained performance could be explained by your position in an industry. And so industry attractiveness and your position in the industry kind of told the whole story. And that's what the economists were all doing at the time. What Penrose did, and this was before anybody really thought it was important, was she said, well, actually, no, there are factors that are unique to firms that explain performance. And industry is much less important in her thinking. And this began the whole resource-based view of the firm, as it's now called, in which we said, you know, the resources of a firm, the capabilities that are unique, path-dependent, and driven by people's individual decisions are what explains performance, not so much industry. Mm, that's interesting. Now, Penrose's main book, The Theory of the Growth of Firm, was published in 1959. That's quite a while ago. Do you think her work is still fresh and relevant for the 21st century? I actually think Penrose's work matters more now than ever, um, because among the things that we are learning uh, in terms of how to understand firm performance is that industry is actually a fairly useless concept, uh, and we have mountains of academic research looking at things like standard industrial classifications and, you know, industry um, units of analysis, and what we're learning is it's just, it doesn't really help you at all. So what industry is Apple in? Well, they could be a technology company, they could be a payments company, they could be a bank, they could be a music company, they, you know, you name it, right? So it doesn't really help you understand very much about what's going on. So I think this rediscovery of Penrose uh, is very timely, and I think actually now it's more important than ever because we're seeing phenomena in competitive exchange that simply can't be predicted by traditional models of strategy. So just to take an example of a traditional model in strategy that I think Penrose's work would really sort of arch a questioning eyebrow to is um, Michael Porter's Five Forces theory of competition. And Porter, Porter's work was brilliant. What he basically did was applied monopoly theory to the behavior of firms. And he said, if you can find yourself a place where you don't have a lot of rivalry, where you have tremendous power over your buyers and suppliers, where there's not a lot of new entry, uh, and where there's not a lot of substitution, you have the potential to make great whopping profits. Well, among the things that that theory completely leaves out are complementary relationships. And Penrose would have said, yes, you know, over time, part of what executives build up in their firms are these complexes of capabilities of which complements would be a, a natural part and that those actually explain a lot more than looking at these more standard features. So I think that's an example of how Penrose was way ahead of her time in understanding firm performance as we think about it today. Do you think we need to return to a more people-focused, talent-focused view of the firm, perhaps a more stakeholder-based model of the firm? Well, what we've learned, I think, in explaining firm performance, especially if you look at the companies that have been unbelievably successful in the last 20 years, you know, the big internet giants really only have been with us a few years, they place enormous emphasis on talent. And you talk about the war for talent and the war for developers. And we've got this very interesting dichotomy going on in firms where some firms are basically treating their people like disposable Kleenex and, you know, fire the left-hand side of the building and, oh, we've got to cut costs, so let's get rid of people. And what I would predict is that that way of thinking actually undermines their long-term competitive advantage. And this is actually uh, relevant to the work of my colleague Zainab Tan at MIT. And she wrote a fantastic book called The Good Job Strategy. And what Zainab's work really highlights is the combination of excellent people 
approaches and excellent technology approaches in the sense of excellent operations and you know really good technology backbone that's what combined gives you superior performance so it's not just the people but the people are an incredibly important part of the equation of course finance is important too but i wonder what the right balance is between finance and business and entrepreneurship do you think we've got that balance right in today's companies well, I've been on record very publicly as saying that I think the balance between finance and the rest of the operations of a firm has gotten way out of whack. And I think this really has its roots in um, the work of Milton Friedman and, and similar economists who said, look, rather than firms being built to support a nexus of stakeholders, which would have been Penrose's view, that firms are really existing only to produce profits for shareholders and shareholders can do what they like in terms of social responsibility, that an executive that doesn't pay attention to profits above everything else is not doing his or her job. And I think we've now seen where that takes us. And where it takes us is underinvestment in innovation, rising income inequality, underinvestment in people and firm capabilities, you know, absolute devastation when it comes to winner-take-all situations. Um, and I think we're really seeing now the beginning of the end of that view being quite so dominant. And I think Penrose would have predicted that. One of the constraints that Penrose identified um, on the growth of firms was the managerial constraint. Has that changed with the introduction of digital technology? Yeah, so I think the idea of managerial constraints on growth was really core to Penrose's work and actually the basis for the very famous Penrose effect, which is sort of you discover a new opportunity and then in the effort to create a reality out of that opportunity, it takes up a lot of managerial time, but that once you've built an organizational capability, you know, your time is now freed up because you've routinized, you've brought in additional help, you've brought in additional people who can now actually make the thing um, work on an ongoing basis, and so that frees up manual cap managerial capability to go pursue something else. Um, so that's the famous Penrose effect, where you have kind of growth and then a slowing of growth, then growth again as you discover new ways of doing things. One of the things that digital technologies have done is actually expand the range of managerial capability which can be used to guide and control organizations. So digital technologies really follow on other kinds of technologies. You know, it's ironic that the year the theory of the growth of the firm was printed was the very first year that commercial scale plain paper copying was available. So if you think about that, right, in Penrose's day it was what photocopies made out of what are those purple, you know, mimeograph things. Um, we didn't even have plain paper copying when she was writing. And so the world has really changed since then. But I think her basic intuition stance, which is that there are managerial limits to what firms can do. What I think digital has done, uh, building on plain paper copying and other innovations, has really decreased the cost and the transaction-heavy nature of the managerial e control equation. So what we're seeing today are much flatter hierarchies, much richer information flows across far greater degrees of distance. So I think there still is a managerial control limit, but it's probably a lot more relaxed as a constraint than Penrose would have anticipated. You touched on the role of innovation there, and I guess Penrose was one of the first economists to really have a kind of idea of the innovative firm. How important is innovation now, not just for mature economies, but, but for economies that I am So innovation to me is absolutely critical. Um, and you know, when I started in the field of strategy, all the cool kids were doing industry analysis and order of entry and so forth. And those of us studying innovation, actually looking within firms, were kind of huddled in the corner for warmth. I mean, it was a very lonely place to be back in those days. And what's happened in the intervening period, I think, is that as the pace of competition's gotten faster, as technologies have enabled us to do things at a much greater scale than we ever were able to before, traditional strategy has now recognized there's this huge overlap with innovation to the point where today I don't think you can really talk about strategy without talking about how it affects um, innovation and likewise you know innovation has to be connected to your strategy and I would say in the last five years my, my own thinking has really evolved to say well you've got this strategy layer you've got the innovation topic on top of that and now what we're seeing is digital is infusing every element of what a strategist has to take into account today so I think innovation is absolutely critical and what we're seeing is firms that don't get that right 
are in the long run really suffering. There's something of a productivity puzzle in the UK at the moment. Mm -hmm. Since the financial crisis and subsequent recession, output has recovered, employment has recovered, but productivity has stayed flat. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are any insights from your work that shed light on that problem? So I think the question of shifts in productivity and the surprising lack of gains in productivity does actually go back to some points that Penrose made, which is that she was interested in studying the creation of new capabilities rather than the reallocation of existing capabilities. And I think what you find in a lot of sectors of the economy today is we're paying a lot more attention to reallocation and a lot less attention to actual capability creation. Because what we're doing is we're using trading and we're using financial resources to basically move assets that exist around. So stocks, bonds, existing assets like real estate. And if you're not making investments in innovation-driven productivity improvement, what you'd actually expect to see is exactly what you articulated, which is employment's fine, you know, growth in, growth in output, some recovery in the financial markets, but no real new growth. And that's where I think Penrock's, Penrose's theory that's why I think Penrose's theory has a lot to teach us in terms of why not. Where would you like to see management schools focusing their attention? Uh, I love the question about the future of business schools, the future of management schools, because I, it really gets to the heart of what it is we think we're doing. And I would say since Penrose's era, we've lost that spirit of inquiry that could only be really covered in book length thoughtful research on actual people and actual organizations and we've sort of been overtaken by physics envy you know where we all want to be scientists and look at things under a microscope and come up with repeatable phenomena and people aren't like that you know there's a body of research and information that suggests that people are kind of quirky now that doesn't mean there are no patterns to be had but I think the kind of fact and empirically based forward-looking research that was embodied in a lot of work that was done in the late 50s and early 60s, we've really gone away from that. And we're rewarding our young academics for producing 30 page pages of uh, research in large scale databases in you know five management journals all over the world. And it's the same five, whether for you or for me or for our institution. Um, and we're not giving enough attention to the kind of work that people like Penrose did, which is forward thinking, which is looking at leading indicators, which is trying to understand phenomena as they are lived. You know, if you think about most of the academic articles published today, it's all lagging indicators. You know, it's massive databases from the past. It's not telling us anything about the future. And the reason I think this is a bit of a tragedy is if you think about our societies, we are among the few professions that actually get paid to think. You know, we have time to think, we're given the resources to think, and shouldn't we be really trying to think about the future rather than just regurgitating statistically significant results from the past? Thank you, Professor McGraw. It's been a real pleasure to have you here to give the Penrose Lectures. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a real honor being here. And you may recall that I mentioned that my mom uh, did her PhD here in this area in, as part of the Queen's, uh, Queen Elizabeth College. And so it was a real honor to be able to come back and you know, give a little bit of a thought to her, as well as learn about what SOAS has been doing. And I really wasn't very familiar with it until coming here. So that's been a great learning experience for me. You've been wonderful hosts. I really appreciate it.